Thank you, uh, Ambassador Sibyl and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't want to get into this uh, argument about uh, soft power, smart power, sharp power, hard power. So uh, if you see from what uh, Ambassador Sibyl said, I deleted soft. It's now only India's public diplomacy approach, successes and challenges. Um, you know, um, those of us who have to think on the feet, uh, when I knew that Ambassador Sibyl was coming, I knew his viewpoint, so I quickly decided that I will skirt this issue. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, we try to act sometimes smart, if not softly. But uh, what I will do is, uh, diplomats usually talk a lot. But what I want you to do is to listen. So I have here for you about five or six um, videos. And I'd like you to listen because they are not Indian speaking. And if they are Indian speaking, they're followed by others speaking. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we need to listen to what others are saying. Uh, then you will understand what our successes are and what our challenges are. So uh, my job will only be to try and take you through those uh, five or six uh, short videos. Uh, obviously, uh, these are uh, uh, not comprehensive. Uh, in 15 to 20 minutes, I can't be comprehensive. I've just chosen five or six, but they will indicate a trajectory. And that trajectory will indicate to you uh, from where we've started and where we intend to, where we are proceeding. So uh, with those uh, initial words, I will quickly try and give you some examples of how our public diplomacy approach was in the past, how is it in the present, and what is there in the future, using all aspects of power, soft, smart, sharp, and even hard if required. So with those opening words, um, let me start off uh, with the past. And um, as Ambassador Sibyl said, soft power is at play in global, uh, in the, on the global stage. Everybody uses it. Even though if the term was used only recently in the 1990s, um, it goes back. And we've been adept at using these irrespective to give us a uh, image of a country which um, has a certain approach to um, global issues. It was my deep personal honor to visit the Rajgat Memorial in India to pay my respects to one of the world's greatest leaders, Mahatma Gandhi. Tonight's theme of peace and nonviolence is an appropriate tribute to his legacy. Thanks to the Permanent Mission of India for supporting this year's event and for selecting the theme, Traditions of Peace and Nonviolence, such a beautiful principle and a fitting theme for this year. 
from the centennial of the birth of Nelson Mandela, a man who resolutely and peacefully defended the rights of millions, to the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, an individual whose very name evokes images of pacifism and nonviolence. <laughs> I just played this uh, just to indicate everybody is in this game. Uh, we are not the only ones. Everyone is in this game. Um, but we can't be left behind. Uh, we can use what is available to us to try and promote a broader theme. Uh, you can use music just for itself, but you can use it linked with nonviolence, peace. You can use peace with Mahatma Gandhi. You can use Mahatma Gandhi as perhaps the icon as far as India is concerned. I mean, there is a theme when you use this in international issues. But that's perhaps soft power 101. You can go beyond that because international fora are also places where soft values are created. And I'd like you to listen to somebody who worked on this 70 years ago. Uh, not many of you here perhaps know of her but perhaps one of the most significant roles that an Indian has played in international issues. Hansa Mehta. I don't know how many of you here are aware of her signal contribution to global values. One. I'm, I'm certain there will be several others, but they would be. But the large majority don't know. Just have a look and then we'll talk about it. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta. The world can thank our daughter of India, Dr. Hansa Mehta, for replacing the phrase in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he said, uh, all men are born free and equal. Now it's changed, all human beings are born free and equal. The dynamics in the United Nations changes radically during the years 1946 to 48, in which the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is being drafted, debated, and voted through different bodies in the United Nations. At the outset, the United States and France, they place a strong emphasis on earlier notions of the rights of man articulated in their respective constitutions. India had already been a member of the United Nations by 1945 and had voted for the charter that same year. But while gaining full independence in 1947, India sends a delegate to the Commission on Human Rights famous for having presented the national flag that same year on behalf of the women of India, Hansa Mehta. Eleanor Roosevelt has not reacted to the use of rights of man in the initial drafts, which is now brought to debate by Hansa Mehta. The preamble of the first draft reads, quote, the General Assembly, and this might have been your preamble, recognizing the fact that the United Nations has been established for the, for the specific purpose of enthroning the natural rights of man to freedom and equality before the law and for upholding the worth and dignity of human personality." End quote. Hansa Mehta, the only female delegate in the Commission on Human Rights besides Eleanor Roosevelt, objects to, to the use of man in the draft, arguing that member states can use this to restrict women's rights rather than expand them since women are not necessarily regarded as included by that wording. One other person that was such a big influence on Eleanor Roosevelt was India's Hansa Mehta. 
for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was Hansa Mader who said, excuse me, Mrs. Roosevelt, if you say all men are created free and equal, around the world it will be all men, women not included. And so the words were changed to all human beings. That small change has had a tremendous impact. Women will be included everywhere. All human beings, men and women and children, have these rights. Seventy years ago, one Indian woman using a soft touch changed not only soft law, but hard international law. But we have failed her. When I asked at the beginning here, how many of us know her? Not many. Not many also know what she did, how she's regarded. It took her 70 years to acknowledge what was perhaps one of the most significant roles of soft power in, of Indian diplomacy. We've just forgotten. We just keep that in mind going forward. Our problem is today, from a country which changed you, all men are born equal to all humans are born equal, today we are told that we seem to be one of the most dangerous places in the world for women. Excuse me, how did this happen? We forgot one of our successes, we lost our way somewhere around. We just need to keep that in mind that public diplomacy is not only getting it right, but also keeping on harping that you got it right, because it has a demonstration effect. Otherwise, ne the next generation and the generations after that will not know what you stood for. Just keep that in mind as we go for another one. This is certainly even Ambassador Sibyl will not say this is soft, but I will indicate why I've clubbed this into this discussion of public diplomacy, smart power, soft power. Contribution to peacekeeping. Just have a look at what others are saying about India's contributions. somehow unko indian medicines par bahut zyada faith hai the contribution you have made to inspiring liberian women for that we will always be grateful bye liberia bye in all these conflicts indian soldiers have distinguished themselves through discipline training and professionalism as a matter of fact india has always been one of the largest peacekeeping countries um, and today, 7,700 Indian peacekeepers are deployed around the world. And the Indian woman formed the first ever all-female UN police unit, which was deployed in Liberia. You have indeed given a very strong contribution to global solidarity and to the international peace and security. And a total of 163 Indian peacekeepers, the highest number of all true contributing countries, as you mentioned, Ambassador, have given their lives for peace. That the people of India has contributed indeed to the freedom, peace of the people of South Sudan. of Hansa Mehta, we got the concept right. We didn't do the implementation properly, perhaps. In the case of peacekeeping, we got the implementation right. We didn't stand up and take responsibility for the notion of protection of civilians. Today, in international law, 
protection of civilians is amongst the most important uh, efforts that any international effort is part of. We were the first, goes back to 1961, when Captain Saleria was given the Paramvir Chakra. No other Indian has ever been given the Paramvir Chakra for having uh, performed outside the boundaries of India, uh, in Africa. Yet, we forgot to, to continue to take ownership of protection of civilians. Today, it's the norm. Just keep that. We need to get the norm right. We need to get the implementation right if we have to get full credit for what we are doing. If you don't, others take over, they move on. Life moves on. And that's part of, being, uh, of our challenge. I'd like now to skip from that to the more recent present so that you can try and look at how things have changed since then. We've learned our lessons to get the norm right, to get the implementation right. Aye, hum ek antarrashtriya yoga divas ko aram karne ki disha mein karya kare. I just thought this I'll use as a small example of getting both right. Sure, you can ask after Om Shanti, 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 does it mean that India is now able to promote greater global peace? Perhaps no. But the point is we are working on an understanding that you need to get the process right, you need to get the thought right, you need to get the implementation right. Otherwise, uh, apart from the International Yo Day of Yoga, there are 200 other international days. You do not find them being celebrated with that enthusiasm. Sure, the government of India puts its entire machinery behind it. Sure, but there is a reason for that. Once you get a thought right, use that continuously. Don't give up. Don't think that it's a uh, one-off thing. In public diplomacy, you need to be persistent, consistent. Only then can you claim ownership of anything. I mean, that's the only short point I'd like to raise with this. Let's go to the next step. I think there is a bit of a glitch. Yes, we are back. I'd like you to look at what are India's major needs. Uh, essentially, as a developing country, India's major challenges will always be internal, always. Given that we are a country of a billion plus, every aspect of our foreign policy, our public diplomacy will be geared towards improving our internal conditions. Uh, and therefore, all aspects of our foreign policy will be targeted. How do we improve that? So just have a look at two or three of the big challenges that India is facing and how we are trying to marry them with global concerns. Our international solar alliance, for the 
उम्मीद की एक बड़ी किरण बनकर सामने आया है हम भी एक ड्रीम लेकर के चले कि एक दुनिया एक सूरज एक ग्रीन वन वर्ल्ड वन सन वन ग्रीन ISA has the right scale of ambition for this moment in the energy transition, an energy transition which will make the world more inclusive, fairer, cleaner and better for all. Thank you for your leadership. In the 21st century, we are living today. We want to go to our mothers and sisters in the open air. We want to go to the dignity of women. Do we want to be all of us? If we want to do 700 crore countries, we want to do that I will never do the wrong thing. तो दुनिया की कौन सी ताकत है जो हमारे शहर गांव को आकर के गंदा कर द्लीन इंडिया मिशन बिल्ड ऑन इज जीनियस एंड लाइफ लॉन्ग क्वेस्ट फॉर ह्यूमन डिग्निटी इट इज बाई फार ऑनरेबल प्राइम मिनिस्टर नॉट ओनली द लार्जेस्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट बट द लार्जेस्ट कैंपेन ऑफ पीपल्स मोबिलाइजेशन इन दिस एरिया अराउंड द वर्ल्ड इट इज इंस्पायरिंग टू सी द इंटरनेशनल कम्युनिटी कम टूगेदर अराउंड दिस इंपॉर्टेंट इश्यू An estimated 2.3 billion people worldwide still do not have basic sanitation facilities. I believe that what's happening in India is quickly changing the statistics. Climate or calamity ka culture se siddha rista hai. Climate ki chinta jab tak culture ka hissa nahi hoti, tab tak. कैलेमिटी से बच पाना मुश्किल है पर्यावरण के प्रति भारत की संवेदना को आज विश्व स्वीकार कर रहा है माय डेयर मोदी जी पॉलिटिकल विशन पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप पॉलिटिकल डेडिकेशन दैट्स व्हाट सो ऑफन इज लैकिंग And that's what I admire so much from you. You are providing that to India and to the much wider world. I just thought I'll just try and portray to you the three biggest challenges India is facing: environment, climate, as well energy, as well as sanitation. All these are being linked increasingly in our foreign policy projections. um there is no shame in acknowledging that you need to improve before 2014 i don't know of many times whether any indian diplomat stood up and talked of sanitation uh maybe ambassador sibel could tell us ever in the 45 years before that whether we did we didn't but today we are confident enough to stand up acknowledge our shortcomings and try to link up with global trends and try to improve ourselves that's the changing face of indian public diplomacy and that we need to keep uh, in mind as we look at how we are going into the future and i'd like to end with a small clip again what others seem to be thinking of what we are doing India's approach to cooperation can be summarized as vasuhaiva kutumbakam or the whole world is one family India was amongst the first countries to to respond to our appeal for assistance after hurricane Irma ravaged our twin island developing agri businesses in Benin for a better attractiveness of agricultural job is one of the primary objective uh, of india and the un uh, partnership fund uh, we receive uh, a huge amount of money from for our standards and it's for our best land report on our sdgs the project aligned with a, with sdg 16 will strengthen the uruguayan government's accountability towards its citizens so let us tap into the experience and philanthropy of india in order to make the south south cooperation a reality india is really showing its strength that they can also be a good partner in ensuring that people remain healthy 
Dr. Grenada's profound gratitude to you personally. You have taken a personal hand in, 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 in getting these projects approved in expeditious manner. So I say India, the project accelerator. Uh, your assistance to us working through UNICEF will enable us reach children who really need help. And Belize has benefited from it, I can personally say so. And I thank you for taking this leadership role as an emerging superpower. India is, for all of us, a very important inspiration. So what's common about all this? Not what they said. We, these are all countries where we don't have a single mission where no prime minister has gone in recent times. All I wanted to say was the reach of public diplomacy goes beyond foreign policy apparatus. Uh, you can see ambassadors from all these countries speaking of their engagements with India with no Indian mission being present there. Uh, it always is a testimony to extending your reach beyond what you, is otherwise possible, and that's what public diplomacy is all about. So if I can quickly summarize, what can we look at as trends in India's public diplomacy in the next few years? Increasingly, it's, it's philosophically in tune with our traditions. So you will find more terminologies, which some of us may not be familiar with, but is inherent in our tradition. Whether that lady was struggling to use the term Vasudeva Kutumbakam, this will become increasingly a term that we will use. It will link India's good with global good in every area of our activity. Of necessity, as a developing country, it will always be development oriented because that's primary for us. Obviously, as a foreign policy posture, it will provide for a role for India, perhaps a leadership role. And finally, while it's good for India, it will also be captured in a way that it is good for the world because it's imbued with a sense of universalism. There are others who look at making improvements for themselves only for themselves. But our approach will be cloaked in a broader, uh, a broader veil. What are the challenges for this? I can certainly look at it uh, separately. But as Ambassador Sibyl and others have said, that if you want to enhance your soft power, you need, I would just make a slight adjustment to what was said before. Soft power requires loud platforms and hard money. I thank you very much.